Yes, Lord. Our text this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Short passage, powerful lesson. I want to read those two verses from the Young's literal translation. The reading of those verses. Then did they return to Jerusalem from the moment from the mount that is called of Olives, that is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath journey. And when they came in, they went up to the upper room where were abiding or staying both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, Simon, and Zealot. Judas of James. One of the foundational reasons for the strength and the dynamic of the early church was their commitment to prayer. In this short passage before us, we're going to consider in our lesson this morning that one of the keys to the early church success was their ability to pray. This kind of prayer led them to impact their world for Christ. Notice the setting. The setting is the upper room in a house in Jerusalem. The disciples have just returned from the Mount of Olives. What took place? Well, they had just witnessed the ascension of Jesus. They are gathered in this room being obedient to his words, 11 disciples, plus Mary, the mother of Jesus, Jesus' brothers, and other women who were followers of Jesus. Their purpose? Well, the purpose was to continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. They were simply waiting for the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's notice several things from these two verses. The first is the place, the place of this prayer. Verse 12 and the very first part of verse 13. It was in the upper room. I want you to make note, some of your translations may have an upper room. It should be the, the definite article the should be there. It was the upper room where they had assembled. Why is it the? Well, it is specifically gearing us to a particular place. We don't know for sure, but it was possibly the same upper room where Jesus had eaten the Last Supper during the Passover with his disciples. According to Luke chapter 22, verse 11 to 13. It also could have been the same room where Jesus <coughs> appeared to the assembled disciples, minus Thomas, after the resurrection, according to John chapter 20 and verse 19. In the room where the disciples were gathered to pray when Peter was put in prison. It was called, according to Acts 12 and 12, the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. We know that it must have at least been a very large room for Acts 1 and 15 says that about 120 disciples were gathered there. And it was there that the Holy Ghost came upon them at Pentecost, Acts 2 and 1. Now I want you to notice something in the, word, in the verse 13, the word staying or abiding, depending on the translation, they were staying or they were abiding is the Greek word that means long terms or headquarters. In other words, wherever this room was, it had become the headquarters of the disciples. Now the period, the period of this prayer. They were gathered in this upper room for 10 days. There for what? They were waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. And Jesus was ascended into heaven 40 days after the resurrection. So from the ascension to Pentecost was 10 days. That was the period of time that they continued 
with one accord in prayer and supplication. Jesus had told the disciples to remain in Jerusalem until they receive power mm -hmm. yes. from the coming of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 8. And during these 10 days in the upper room, they chose a replacement for Judas, the disciple who had betrayed Jesus. This was a time for preparation and a time for waiting. Getting ready for the activity that would begin with the coming of the Holy Spirit. There are always times of preparation before great moves of God. This must have been a challenging 10 days for the disciples, and especially Peter, who was always ready to act rather than wait. But this occasion, he had to wait. Sometimes we have to wait. We need to learn lessons regarding the waiting. Waiting on God is proof of trust. Say that with me. Waiting on God, Waiting on God is, proof of trust. is proof of trust. Waiting also provides God time to address the problems that we encounter as Christians. We know God to be a miraculous working God. But when we try to get ahead of Him, we rob Him of the opportunity to prove right. His power in our lives. So Amen. we got to learn how to wait. They are waiting. Amen. I'm going to take the angle this morning and, and we're going to look at some seasons, seasons for preparation. Next week as we look at the choosing of the, uh, of the extra disciple, the 12th disciple to take Judah's place, I'm going to give a lesson on waiting. But today I want us to understand what this season of preparation is all about. No one is born qualified. We must become qualified. Are you with me? Once you recognize that God has given you an assignment, we got to be ready to be prepared. Get ready for God's seasons. When we look at the life of Moses. He spent the first 40 years learning the wisdom of the Egyptians. Acts chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brother and the children of Israel. And you know the story. He turns around and he spends another 40 years learning the lessons of leadership. Exodus 3 and 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God. Acts 7, verse 30 and 31. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord and a flame of fire and a bush. And when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to it, to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him. Moses was learning for 80 years. Moses was preparing for 80 years. During his first 40 years, he was learning in the Egyptian camp. During the second 40 years, he was a shepherd. And he was learning to be a shepherd of sheep. Preparation. Preparation. Preparation is needed. The disciples are in the upper room and they are getting ready to be prepared. Even when we look at the life of Jesus, he spent 30 years preparing for the ministry. Yes. Galatians 4 and verse 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape 
like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about thirty years of age. These days seem so different for many who are in the church. The average young preacher or the average young minister wants to prepare in the shortest amount of time. But Jesus did the opposite. He prepared 30 years for a public ministry that lasted only three and a half years. Even when we look at the life of Paul, he was a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee. He had invested many years in preparation for the intelligence of his generation. Philippians 3 verse 4 through 6 says, If any other man thinketh that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless, says Paul, in the first part of his life. Yeah, but that wasn't enough. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, but what things were to gain for me those I counted lost for Christ. And then there had to be some more years tacked on. Galatians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and abode with him 15 days. After all this time, after all of this preparation in the academias, from sitting at the feet of the greatest philosophers of his time, he yet had to spend three more years in the desert before God could initiate him into ministry. Then we read in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul ministers and he mentors others. I want, I want to give you 14 little seasons of life that, that need to occur in ministry. Different seasons. Some of you all are in some of these seasons now. You're wondering what's happening. It's preparation for something. It's preparing us for something. The first season is called the season of affliction. The season of affliction. Second Timothy. Chapter 1. You can go and get 2 Timothy because we're going to just kind of survey through there real quickly as Paul gives us these 14 different seasons. We just want to read the scriptures and may say a couple words here and there. Season number 1 is a season of affliction. The verse says, But be thou partakers of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. Affliction. Going through Uncomfortable times. Number two is the season of solitude. Solitude. 2 Timothy 1 and 4. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Seasons when you find yourself alone. Solitude. God is preparing you for something. Number three, the seasons of warfare. Warfare. 2 Timothy 2, verse 3 and 4. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangling himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Times of spiritual warfare. It seems like every turn the adversary is at you. Then there are seasons of suffering. Going through painful experiences. 2 Timothy 2 and 12. But if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And if we deny him, he will also deny us. Seasons of suffering. Things are real tight, very uncomfortable, hurtful. And then number five, there is the seasons of learning. 2 Timothy 2 and 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So far, we've gone through the season of what? 
Affliction. Affliction. Number two. Solitude. Solitude. Number three. Warfare. Warfare. Number four. Suffering. Suffering. Number five. Learning. Learning. Anybody hit one of these so far? All right, let's look at number six. The season of carnal desires. Carnal desires. It's a season. It's a season. So the matter, 2 Timothy 2 and 22. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness. Faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Then there are seasons of contention. Contention. 2 Timothy 2, verse 23 and 24. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. There will be times when folk will come and talk to you about crazy stuff, dealing with the Word of God. And the sinner can just come out of nowhere. Learn how to avoid that. It's a season for that. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and be patient. When that season comes upon you, you must be patient. You must be able to be gentle with your response. Not so nearly just to snap people up and, 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 and show them up, but be gentle and move along. Number eight, there's a season of persecution. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11 and verse 12. All these seasons are in this book. Because Paul is writing to a young pastor and he's preparing this young pastor for these different seasons. Persecution. Persecution, afflictions, which came upon me, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Oh, yes. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Yes. Then number nine, there's the season of proving. The season of proving. Proving. 2 Timothy 4 and 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof, make full proof of thy ministry. Then number 10, there is a season of disloyalty. Disloyalty. 2 Timothy 4 and 10. But Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Seasons of disloyalty. What was number one? Seasons of affliction. Number two. Solitude. Number three. Number four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Number nine. Ten. Then it's the season of injustice. 2 Timothy 4 and 14. Alexander the Coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Number 13, there's a season of isolation. 2 Timothy 4 and 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it might not be laid to their charge. Season of isolation. And Thirteen is the season of supernatural intervention. Notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. That by me the preaching might be fully known. And that all the Gentiles might hear. 2 Timothy 4 and 17. Then the last, number 14, Seasons of Deliverance. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. As you read about the apostles' life in the book of Acts, it is evident that he walked in victory, but he came through these seasons. So can you and I. We can walk in victory no matter what season we find ourselves in. Romans 8 and 37 says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. How? Through him that loved us. How many of you all saw the original Karate Kid? I think it contains one of the most powerful movies that gave us some lessons. You know, in the story, the young man desperately wanted to learn the art of fighting. 
His old mentor wanted to teach him how to fight. But instead of just suiting him up right away and heading for the ring, he waited and handed the young man, first of all, a paintbrush with the instructions to paint the fence. You know, you remember the thing about the story, the young man got disheartened, but somehow he followed his mentor's instruction. Discouraged, disillusioned, and very disappointed, the kid could not see any relationship between painting a fence and fighting in the ring. And then when he was finished, his mentor, his mentor gave him another assignment of washing and waxing his car. And as he moved his hands in a circular motion over the car, he felt very, very little. And he thought, how will this help me in my future? How will this help me achieve my desire to be a great fighter? But as the kid continued to work, even in confusion and despair, the older and much wiser mentor knew that each motion of his student's hands would develop the hands of a fighter. The young man did not discern this until much later, and when he did, it all made sense. Like the karate kid, I can look back on many seasons in in my 60-some years of living, in which I felt totally ignorant and unaware of the purpose of that specific season. And in many of them, I wondered, how could God get any glory out of this situation? Now I'm beginning to understand how He divinely intervenes in every season. And how He seeks to teach us so much. Yeah. Never forget that your Heavenly Father knows what He is doing in our lives. Amen. Job said in uh, Job 23 and 10, But He knoweth the way that I take. When He has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You may not discern His presence in some of the seasons. Job said in Job 23, verse 89, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, and I cannot perceive him on the left hand where he does work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand. I cannot see him. Even in these seasons of chastising, when he's educating us to correct us, it may not make sense. So the word of God says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Scourges every son whom he receiveth. Now, no chastisement for the present seemed to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised. Mm -hmm. So, brothers and sisters, I want us to fully embrace the expectation of special seasons in our life that God has scheduled, God has ordered in our lives. Expect every possible season that we have named and maybe some that we haven't named. But I want you to know something. At the end, you come out the way he has intended for you to come out. Amen. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. You will survive your season. This 120, they survived the season of waiting for what God had promised. So we've talked about the place and the period. Now let's take a moment and look at the participants. The participants in this prolonged prayer meeting were the original disciples minus Judas Iscariot. Now notice the people that are here. In addition, you got the mother of Jesus, the brothers of Jesus were there as well as other women who had been followers of the Lord. Peter usually appears as the first name when the disciples are listed in the New Testament, and that signifies that in most cases, he was considered to be the leader. Luke lists him first here because of the prominent role that he would play in spreading the gospel and the formation of the church in the book of Acts. It's interesting that only three of these 11 apostles are mentioned Hereafter in the book of Acts. 
others such as Stephen and Paul and Barnabas seem to take their place. Luke gives prominence to the role of women in his writings. And I want you to notice that as we walk through the book of Acts, how much is said about women and the ministry of women in the church? There have been no elevation of Mary in this state. She's just one of the 120. The place, the period, the participants, now the practice, the practice of prayer. Two dynamics I want you to notice. Two dynamics mark prayer that was practiced for 10 days in this upper room. They were continually praying, and it was a community prayer. Let's look at this as marked by their being continuous, continuous prayer. These all continued with one accord. Literal words from the text. They were continually devoting themselves to prayer. It wasn't on and off every, every other day. They were continuing in prayer. There was a continuum in their actions, a steady consistency, a faithfulness for 10 full days. And you know some of us have trouble praying 10 full minutes. 10 full days of prayer. The apostles and the disciples in the upper room they weren't just praying for the Holy Ghost to come or to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, as we often hear. The gift of the Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit had already been promised by Jesus. So there was no need to pray for that to happen. He had already said it was going to happen. They were, I believe, probably praying, Lord, prepare us for what lies ahead. Prepare us to accomplish the commission that you have given us to fulfill. We need to appreciate the Spirit's power to prepare us for work. We really don't appreciate the season unity of faith that we have here. Let me say it again. We are not appreciating the season that we have here. We find ourselves in this room. It's a season. It's a season for preparation. Yes. Amen. We're not appreciating it. We're not appreciating it. We're, we're yet going through some ups and downs, some negatives and positives. Every once in a while, we may get on board that we're here. But it's a season. It's just a season. It has a beginning and there will be an end. There will be an end. But all oh, a testimony is going to come for us. I think it was helpful to spend extended time on these early verses in the book of Acts because they become like an overture in a symphony. They are themes that reappear throughout the book. Prayer is prominent in the book of Acts. I want to give you at least, at least three. I think I got three or four. The early Christians determined the will of God by prayer. Look at verse 24. Look at verse 24. This will be part of my text next week. When choosing a replacement for Judas Iscariot, they narrowed their choice to two candidates, Joseph and Matthias. And then they did what? They prayed. Oh Lord, show which of these you have chosen. We are facing difficult situations every day, not only in our church, but in our home. Amen. How much time do we give to prayer? Amen. Oh, Jesus. we think that money can get us out of every situation, or prominent people, if I only know the right person, if I can only buy this or get that. Brothers and sisters, unity of faith, we need to learn the art of prayer. If anything, we ought to be doing together if we ought to be praying together. Yes. We ought to be coming and on being on one accord. God, you give us direction. Yes. God, you give us direction. You tell us where to go. You lead us where we need to be. Oh, yes. This was the attitude of those disciples. They wanted to determine the will of God, and it wasn't by counsel. It wasn't by having church meeting. It was having a prayer meeting. The early church also developed their priorities around prayer. In the book of Acts, chapter 6, we read about the church's first major encounter with administrative problems. 
the apostles were neglecting prayer and the ministry of the word according to the fourth verse of that sixth chapter and as a result of having to manage the ministry of a rapidly growing church and to remedy the situation seven men were chosen from among the body to take care of the food distribution program so that the apostles could return to their priorities which was prayer and the ministry of the word. Praying and studying and delivering the word of God. As a pastor, I have to work hard to not to get involved with what people think is a prior necessity for a pastor. And learn to stay with what God's word says that a leader of a congregation is supposed to be engaged in. And that's prayer and the studying of God's word. When spiritual leaders fail to pray, now they may grow big. They may grow wide, may get many members, may have lots of money, material things, but I'm here to tell you, according to the word of God, when they fail to pray, and when they fail to spend time in the word, they become malnourished. Ultimately, they're going to lead an undeveloped spiritual church. So the early church, they determined the will of God by prayer. They developed their priorities around prayer. And then number three, the early church died and went to heaven in prayer. Stephen, chapter 6, verse 5, the word of God said he was a man full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. He was the church's first martyr, the first one to die for a cause. He died in a way that many martyrs since have died in prayer. He prayed according to Acts 7, verse 59 and 60. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And as he stood there being stoned to death by Jewish religious leaders, oh, we know about this. We studied this, I think, on Wednesday night. The heavens opened up. And Jesus, on the right-hand side of God, stood up. And he died praying. What a beautiful way to go. Number four, the early Christians did miracles by prayer. According to Acts chapter 9, verse 40, when a woman, a follower of Jesus, her name was Dorcas, when she died, you remember Peter brought her back to life out through prayer. But Peter put them all out and he knelt down and prayed according to the 40th verse of that ninth chapter. Miracles needed to take place. They didn't go talking about people. They began to pray. Number five, the early Christians defeated Satan. How? Through prayer. <clears throat> when the church began moving in Jerusalem, Peter was arrested and thrown in jail by Herod. And the night before Peter was to be brought to trial, the story says that an angel broke Peter out of jail. And after which he made his way to Mary's house where the disciples had been praying all night long for release. Because of the arrest, they were hesitant to open the door when Peter was on the outside knocking. But he finally gained entrance. The Lord had delivered Peter from this certain death in answer to the church's prayer for his safety according to Acts 12 verses 1 through 19. Oh, how we need to pray. We need to pray. We want deliverance. We want God's help. We need his deliverance. We need him to come and fulfill his promises, but we got to pray. We got to pray. We got to pray. I talk about it, but we got to pray. Not two or three minutes before we lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to think that won't make it. You got to pray through. You got to pray the word of God. You got to pray. We got to pray, church. And then number six, the early Christians deployed their missionaries through prayer. This is one of the things we really miss around missing the church today. Folks don't want to be deployed through prayer. They simply want to be able to say, Sister Maddie, the Lord told me to go. And because the Lord told me to go, I got to go. But that wasn't the way it was in the early church. I want you to read it with me. Well, I'm going to give you the scripture in Acts 13. Acts chapter 13. When it came time for this newly church to set out their first missionaries and individuals to leave the church for other ministries, what did they do? 
according to verse 3 of the 13th chapter. They fasted and they prayed. And then they sent them out. Everything this early church did, it was bathed in prayer. Their prayer was marked by a continuous pattern. They were continuously praying. Unity of faith, and we follow this model. The model of the church in the book of Acts. We will bathe every aspect of the life of our church in prayer. Whether we're talking about missions, whether we're talking about outreach, the youth ministry, the children's ministry, the singing, the teaching, the preaching, every aspect, the elders, the leaders, the pastors, the women's ministry, the men's ministry, it must be bathed in prayer, prayer, prayer. prayer. Then it was also marked by community. I believe this is the last point. It was marked by the community. The apostles and the disciples. Notice the text says that they were praying with one accord. Luke uses a peculiar word here. And I think I'm going to have to uh, uh, really emphasize it next week as we move on. Because I want you to see this word. But he uses this one word about 10 plus times in his writing. It occurs mostly in the book of Acts than any other place in the New Testament. It means to come together and become united so that a oneness is developed. Coming together, becoming united so there's a oneness. They were praying with one mind. They were praying for the same thing. The early Christians, number one, prayed in one accord. One commentator has noted there was a five-fold unity that they prayed. There was a unity of the plan. Luke 24 and 49, a unity of, of the place in the upper room, a unity of purpose. They were waiting for the Spirit, a unity of persistence. They prayed until the Holy Spirit came. They prayed when Jesus said was coming. There was a unity of prayer itself. They were not divided over what they should be accomplishing in prayer. There was unity. I know of no place or event in which unity is felt more strongly than when the body of Christ is united in prayer. Yet most churches struggle to find ways to express their unity in prayer. And we have a great opportunity, unity of faith, to pray for the same thing. And to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit until God answers. Until God makes a way. Until God brings a change. Now he's going to bring a change because he said so. Or oh, whether you believe it or not, I, I know he's going to bring a change. But we got to pray. We got to pray. More than anything else. We don't need the choir back up again. We didn't have that. We didn't have the soul train line. We have had the best band. Y'all ain't talking to me. I know some of y'all long for those days. Those days are gone, bygone. But God wants to pray. Because there's a new thing he wants to produce through us. There's a power of the word of God. There's a power of living right. There's an affecting of a community that must be birthed through us. We can't go back and get back what we once had. That's gone. It's gone. Stop looking at yesterday. Yesterday is yesterday. Yesterday is gone. But what we have today, God got something better for us tomorrow. No, but we got to pray. We got to pray. We got to pray. We can't have one person praying for the old stuff. Praying, praying that this will come back. Praying that we, we get this. Uh, you want a place that looked like it was on Rock Ridge, or you want a place that had everything that was on Old Covenant Taylor. That's gone. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's gone. Be expecting God to bring something new in us. Amen. But we gotta pray. Oh, yes. Yes. You can't just wish it. You just can't come up here and just hope it's gonna happen. Yeah, I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see if Pastor really a man of God. No, we got to pray. Yes. I'm not here to prove whether or not I'm a man of God. I'm gonna yes. preach the word. That the word do that. But we got to pray. Yes. I wish I had a couple folks with me, but that's all right. That's all right. God would grant us as followers of Jesus much prayer. We would pray together. Yes. Much prayer. You got to understand, prayer is a vital part of worship. Pray. Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> he 
got to pray. It was marked. The early Christians waited in one accord. Number two, they not only prayed in one accord, but they waited patiently in one accord. They waited for what? For the gift of the Spirit that we're reading Sunday by in Acts chapter 2. There could have been there could have been some impatience and discontent over a 10-day period. But the text doesn't indicate that. The text indicated that for 10 days they waited patiently for what God said he was going to do. And number three, the early Christians worshipped in one accord. And we really will see this as we study in future lessons, Acts chapter 2, verse 46 and 48. Then the early Christians worked together in one accord. They worked together in one accord. Acts 15, verse 25. When the first major theological dispute in the early church arose, the leaders met together in one accord and reached a consensus on what they should do. Don't tell me, Deacon, that we cannot come together as leaders and determine God's will. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I want you to hear me, Deacon. I want you to hear me. Yeah. They came together. Yes, yes. It wasn't what God told me this. They came together. And God gave a consensus among the leaders. Yes, yes. We all think, well, I got a right to my own view. I got a right to have my own opinion. Yeah, you do have a right to your own opinion, but God's word and the consensus of the group should overrule your own independent feeling. Amen. They come together, they came together, and they prayed together, the leaders, and they heard from God together. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's much better to, to come to church and to work and to worship, and coming together and focusing all of our energies on prayer and serving the Lord. You'd be surprised the kind of difference that would make. As we go through the book of Acts, we're going to find so many more evidences of the power of prayer as we study. The ones I like best is found in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, where some opponents of the gospel describe the Christians as those who turn the world upside down. I think that is such a powerful phrase. When was the last time the unbelieving world looked at the church of Jesus Christ and accused it of having such an influence on the world as turning it upside down. May God grant unity of faith in every follower of Jesus Christ in this 22nd century and to the churches that's coming even after us. May our world be revolutionized. May our communities be impacted. May their lives be turned upside down because of the people who pray together. Amen. And let the church say amen. 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 Thank you, Lord.